Hey, what's up, guys? I don't always get a chance to do this, but uh, when I do have an opportunity to, I kind of like to try to have one of these uh, sort of what I call the afternoon videos um, uh, have a little bit to do with what I just uh, reported on in um, the uh, uh, blog post today for those of you who don't want to read the blog. And sometimes we come across things that are really interesting. So I'll tell you the story behind this. Um, there was someone on Twitter, and I know Twitter is not the best place to go around and uh, search for your baseball information. There was someone on there on one of these uh, old-time baseball photos or uh, baseball card things that I uh, follow um, who was talking about Mike Donlin. Now, if you know about Mike Donlin, he used to play for the New York Giants, including in 1908. And uh, Donlin was known particularly for his um, love of the stage. At the end of the 1908 season, after the Giants were um, unsuccessful, um, he uh, got a part in a uh, play that I think was maybe even on Broadway. I don't know. I have to look more information up about this one. Um, he wound up leaving baseball baseball for a full year so he could pursue his uh, acting career and then came back afterwards I think for 1910 very very interesting person so um, in this article I was reading about him they were talking about how uh, oh Donlin you know uh, became friends with John McGraw in 1901 when uh, Donlin went over to the American League and started playing with the Orioles. Um, now, I don't want to disparage the person who wrote this article, but um, whoever wrote that has no idea about what was happening in 1901 and about how the game worked and about how John McGraw in particular worked. If you know about those 1901 Orioles, and we'll talk about them a little bit later, this was a team... It was sort of like the John McGraw, I want to say nepotism team, but that's not quite true because they weren't family members. It was people who had connections with McGraw, including a lot of older players who'd played with Baltimore before in the 1890s. Donlin was the sort of player that fit in uh, perfectly well. He was this kid from California, came up in 1899 with St. Louis, um, originally as a pitcher, a uh, very, very young type player, and he was very brash, kind of like McGraw himself. Um, he uh, had about three outings as a pitcher, didn't fare so well, but he was very good as a hitter and was also a skilled shortstop and wound up uh, playing in the field. Um, and uh, what we tend to forget is that in 1900, after uh, being a uh, holdout for about a month and a half in real life, John McGraw eventually did join the St. Louis team, which is how the two of them met. Now, I don't have anything to show you here that's like, oh, here is like the smoking gun or anything like that, right? And I do have a little bit of... Um, uh, I guess, uh, empathy with the uh, uh, those who write these uh, historical pieces for Sabre and for the Sabre Biography Project, not just because it's kind of a thankless task that you don't make any money off of, but because I know that it's really, int it's really easy as you try to piece together a historical narrative to sort of let some of the uh, real interesting stuff slide. Now, Donlin is an interesting person because his character will tell us a lot about the sort of guy John McGraw was. Right. If you think that you know players who are rough and tumble today, just wait until you see this. First thing, though, we're going to go take a look here at this paper. This is from the uh, St. Louis Republic, uh, June 25th, 1900. This is during uh, the, uh, uh, I believe this is the Boxer Rebellion in uh, China. And, um, yeah, there was a lot of fighting around uh, Tianjin and a bunch of other stuff there. I won't get too into this. This is really interesting to me for other reasons, um, but uh, we won't talk about that here because this isn't a politics channel or an international relations channel. We'll just take a look here uh, really quick. You can see all the uh, advertisements for things like women's garments and stuff like that. Um, and here is uh, the uh, cartoon lampooning uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And... Um, We'll go over here to page four. Still not too much going on here of interest to us unless you want some Carter's little liver pills. But here in page five, this is the part where it's really interesting. So um, this is the St. Louis Republic, right, in St. Louis. And uh, there's this big article that was covered in all three of the major St. Louis papers that I have access to, and I'm guessing there were more. Um, Mike Donlin, he was involved in a brawl um, at 18th Street and Washington Avenue, I don't know where that is in St. Louis, around 4 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Um, I don't think that there was Sunday ball, and maybe I think that there was actually Sunday ball in St. Louis, but whatever. Um, and uh, he was... Uh, he went to the hospital and claimed that he was a machinist by trade. Uh, he does work as a machinist when he's not playing baseball. Yes, yeah, so he um, kind of threw, threw a little um, hat, half uh, truth there. This is probably a little bit too small for you to see, but here we go. Maybe you can uh, make this out along with me. The cause of the trouble was some disparaging remarks Donlin made to a stranger regarding his appearance. The stranger wore a long red beard and Donlin guyed it. I'm not sure what guide means. Donlin has two bad cuts across the throat, one along the right side of his face, running vertically down his cheek close to the ear, one across his cheek beneath the eye, another slight gash across the nose, and the fingers of both hands are seriously slashed and cut. 
I mean, he grabs the knife his assailant used, thus getting these last cuts, right? So, I mean, this is uh, pretty big, right? Donlin is not seriously injured, but his wounds will leave marks forever. He will not be able to play ball for at least three weeks. And then we go through this article. You can go check it out um, on the uh, post that I made on the blog today and learn all sorts of stuff here, right? Um, <laughs> this is a lot of fun, you know. So uh, here's Donlin and his friend. The friend, other papers speculated, was another player on the Cardinals. Um, they, uh, <laughs> so they go out of the saloon, stood on the sidewalk, and um, they spoke a lot of the elder, elderly stranger's whiskers. The man got angry, told him to calm down. Donna laughed and again cracked a joke about his whiskers, running his fingers through them as he did so. <laughs> just, just, so he's provoking him. Then the man who was about 45 years old hit at Donlin but missed him. Donlin did not hit him back but caught the man's arm and gave him a push away saying, none of that, what's the matter with you? Just then the younger man who was together with this older guy leaped at Donlin from behind and slashed him along his face. Along the face. Donlin turned around with a cry and started for the fellow. As he did so, he was cut again and again. He grabbed the fellow's hand after several vain efforts, but the knife cut into his fingers, and he had to let go. In fact, the cuts in his fingers rendered him powerless, and he was, like, covered in blood. I mean, this is incredible. This is actually absolutely an incredible story. So, what I'll tell you about this, which is very interesting, is that this story, believe it or not, does not appear anywhere. And I mean anywhere at all in that uh, Sabre piece um, about uh, the Sabre biography piece of Mike Donlin. Do you think that that would be pretty important, right? Like, you think it would be pretty important to talk about the fact that this guy was, like, cut up with a knife and pretty seriously he had a gash down here, a gash up here, and his hands were totally cut up because he tried to grab the knife away? Nothing about it, not even a mention. This was major news in multiple newspapers. The funny thing about this, though, if you want to know how uh, hardcore these players were, is um, Donlin was back uh, five days later to play ball. He was he played on June 29th, 1900. So he didn't, no, no, none of this three weeks out of action. No, he didn't miss anything, right? So think about that next time. Next time you see a player who's got one of those little gashes on his finger or whatever, and he's got to miss you know a couple of weeks on the DL. Think about Mike Donlin, who was attacked um, in a bar with a guy by a guy with a knife, and probably came close to being killed, and um, who wound up missing a total of five games as a result. They made him a little different back in those days. I'll tell you that. So now, when we talk about John McGraw, this tells you something about McGraw, who I think what did I say last time was like 26 or 27 at the time with this team. Donlin goes with McGraw from St. Louis to Baltimore, right? He goes from the established league to an unestablished league. And this is Mike Donlin, who was out on a Sunday morning at four in the morning at a bar making fun of some guy for his beard and getting in knife fights, right? I mean, this doesn't sound to me like somebody who's going to be like really, you know, uh, uh, really uh, obedient, you know, and compliant with everything. No, this is a pretty brash, you know, wild young person. And uh, when McGraw comes along, he respects McGraw a lot. That's the sort of person that John McGraw was, right? Um, a little bit of, of it, I think, is sort of, you know, your kind of a rough and tumble, you know, uh, new sheriff in town type of attitude, which I think McGraw definitely had. But I think a lot of it, too, was actual leadership ability. I mean, because it's not easy to lead any sort of people to go do anything, much less people who are out getting in knife fights at bars at four in the morning, right? <laughs> But uh, in this case, uh, Donlin went with McGraw. He left Baltimore at the end of 1901, which is one of the reasons why Baltimore was so bad in 1902, and ended up going back to McGraw, this time to New York in 1904, and that's how he was on the Giants back in 1908. Interesting stuff, and as I said before, this is the sort of story that you're not going to read in a lot of the books. I don't know of any books out there about Mike Donlin, which is kind of odd. There should be. Maybe there is. I'm just dumb, don't know it. Um, and you won't read about in the official Saber biography, right? I know what you're going to think. Well, maybe I should go and, like, edit up the biography and rewrite it and stuff like that. Now, I don't know if they really want me because I'll get stuck on, like, one year or, like, one week, and then we'll talk about it for days and days. I think it's good enough to have a couple blog posts about it or whatever to make a YouTube video, and we can talk about it and enjoy it. Anyway, keep that in mind. They don't make players quite the same way that they used to, um, for better or for worse. Um, uh, it's always frustrating when your favorite player is out for a long time with an injury, but at least uh, he's probably not running into uh, saloons in the middle of the night getting in uh, knife fights. I sure hope not. Hope that you enjoyed that. I'll talk with you tomorrow. Bye.